All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. We have two actual classes left. I, I can't believe it. I mean, today and Monday are your last actual class left. Wednesday with the review. So we are, we are, we are, we are almost at the end of the tunnel, and you can see the train running towards you, right? Like, <laughs> don't stay away from the light. That wasn't where you thought I was going, was it? That was going somewhere else. Though. Yes. So, uh, questions? Anything on your mind? What's on your mind? Anything? Hopefully something. So the difficulty of teaching this class in May is that we get opinions from the Supreme Court that change stuff between classes. So fortunately for you, I will summarize this so you don't have to read anything. Because uh, yesterday the Supreme Court dropped a nice 108-page opinion that ruined my day because I did nothing but read it. I was up till midnight reading the entire thing. But I've, I'm not joking, but I've, di I've digested it. I've internalized it. So I'll explain the case. So we discussed the Michigan Affirmative Action cases. We discussed Grutter and Gratz. And in those cases, the Supreme Court said that affirmative action is barely constitutional, just barely, right? When is it constitutional? Not to fix past grievances against minorities, not to provide social justice. Affirmative action only works if the compelling interest is academic diversity. That's it. It's hanging by a prayer, okay? That, that, that's, all, that's all they got. Okay. And then, of course, we did the Fisher case from UT Austin. And again, the, in that case, the Supreme Court kind of punted on the issue. They didn't actually decide uh, whether to overrule the Michigan case. So they kind of just kicked the can down the road. But we have another case called, it's pronounced Shooty, rhymes with duty. In fact, his Twitter handle is Shooty on duty. To, to, so people remember, not that duty. Don't. Kids love that word. I don't know why. Anyone ever knows that little kids love that word? I don't know why. Of all the bad words, they love that word. Du duty. You've never heard of it? Oh, okay. So after the Michigan affirmative action cases, right, the people of Michigan, led by a woman named Jennifer Gratz, you might remember her, she won. So the, I, I've met her. She, she, she's still very engaged in this, right? So she proposed an amendment to the Michigan Constitution. Okay? This amendment would have effectively prohibited Michigan universities, Michigan University of Michigan, Michigan State, and the ever popular Wayne State from using affirmative action. It would have made it illegal for any school official in any Michigan university to employ any race-based uh, 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 admission practices. I'm going to pause for a minute. The word affirmative action, I didn't think was controversial. But in Justice Sotomayor's dissent in the Shooty case, she had a footnote, which said she will not use the word affirmative action, this is sort of newspeak, she will call it race-sensitive admission practices. Race-sensitive admission practices. I will call it affirmative action because that's too long. I can't remember that longer phrase. But I, I will uh, 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 leave that out there. Uh, Justice Sotomayor also made news a couple years ago when she would not use the phrase illegal uh, alien. That was the word in the statute. She called them an undocumented immigrant. So words have evolving meaning. So, they propose this amendment, and the purpose of this amendment would be to make it illegal to use affirmative action, okay? Now you might ask, the Supreme Court had just said affirmative action is barely constitutional, right? And we should get rid of it in 25 years if we believe Justice O'Connor, which we, you shouldn't, right? So how could it possibly be a problem if the state says, we will not use affirmative action, right? We will not use it. If affirmative action is barely constitutional, shouldn't it be a good thing to eliminate it? Well, that's what Jennifer Gratz thought when she proposed this, and it passed the ballot in Michigan. The people voted on it. Like here in Texas, we can amend the Constitution. It's not, I mean, it's, it's difficult. You have to have a lot of people sign petitions, and you have to propose it, and all this other stuff. But it got in the ballot, and it was, it was passed. So you think that this would be like, you know, okay, whatever. They're eliminating this use of race in higher education, right? So what happened? Okay. They sued. Who sued? a group of minority people uh, who are very much in favor of affirmative action. They're, the name of the group is the Coalition for Affirmative Action by Any Means Necessary. BAM. That's actually their name. They call it BAM, by any means necessary. Uh, Google them. They're, they're, they're a funny group. Sh Shanta Driver uh, did a terrible job arguing it, uh, but, but that's her group. 
And what do they argue? Or more precisely, what did the court I used to clerk for argue for them, right? So the Sixth Circuit, which is a lower court, fashioned this argument based on something called political process theory. Okay? This sounds very deeply in footnote four of Carolean products, which we've studied ad nauseum, right? Footnote four of Carolean products. So this theory, which has been supported in a couple Supreme Court cases, says this. If a majority restructures the political process to take away some benefit to a minority, it violates the Constitution. Stated simply, affirmative action benefited minorities. The majority restructured that process to now take away that benefit and make it impossible to obtain that, that the affirmative action. And they said this itself was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Even though the Equal Protection Clause, as Justice Harlan said, sees no colors, the fact that they eliminated affirmative action was now unconstitutional. <laughs> so I am extremely biased in this case because it was my case when I clerked. I, I did, this was my case. I wrote an entire dissent, which was never published, but I've used it for other purposes, right? So I am extremely biased in this case. I encourage you to read what other people have written. Uh, if, so if you want a more balanced take, but I, I give that disclaimer, okay? So the lower court effectively said, they have now taken out of the hands of minorities in Michigan the ability to lobby. Now, one thing you might not appreciate is that the members of, I'm sorry, the, uh, in Michigan, you actually vote for the trustees of the universities. In Texas, are they appointed by the governor, I'm guessing? Yeah. In, in Michigan, you actually vote for the trustees of the university. So the people who actually make the admission decisions, in theory at least, are appointed by the people, right? They elect them. What they said was, you've now taken that away from us. We can't vote for pro-affirmative action trustees. We're now stuck, right? So if you want to vote for, say, a trustee who gives legacy preferences, people who have, you know, their parents went there, we can do that. If you want to vote for someone who wants to give preferences to, I don't know, uh, uh, musicians, you can do that. But this one element, race, is now out of the picture. Interestingly enough, they don't actually mean all minorities. They don't actually mean that. For example, Asians supported this. They, they, they tend to hate affirmative action because it actually uh, uh, harms them. So whenever Justice Sotomayor uses the word minority, she actually does interchange, which means racial minority, which means blacks and Hispanics. Those are the two minority groups she discusses in her opinion. So what did the Supreme Court do here? Well, it was a very split opinion. I'll start with Justice Scalia's opinion from, for himself and Justice Thomas because they're the simplest, right? Justice Scalia and Thomas would have overruled these political process theory cases from the 80s. He said they were wrong when they were decided, and they're wrong today. It can't conceivably violate the protection clause to eliminate race-based preferences. It can't conceivably do that, Scalia said. Okay. Oh, I wrote, I wrote, in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, I wrote a draft dissent for the, um, the lower court decision, but it was never published. So, I use it elsewhere. It's okay. So, Scalia said that, but Scalia went further. He called footnote four, ready for this, dictum. Oh. Nino basically said footnote four is not binding. He is, by my count, the first justice to ever say that. He called them dictimizers. <laughs> Let me write this word. Dictimizer. Oh. He has a way of words unlike any other in the court. Him and Kagan are the best writers. But what does a dictimizer? He's trying to he's trying to merge together a victimizer, like one who victimizes, with a footnote four dictum. So using the footnote four dictum to victimize minorities, he is, I mean, you might hate him, but he is such a good writer. Read his opinion. It reads like a Seth Meyers rant on SNL. There's this one bit where he's going, really? Really? It, it's, uh, I, again, I'm really biased here, but it, it's, it's quite good, okay? Uh, so Scalia basically said, Footnote four is dictum. He said something I didn't know, that only four members joined in a seven-member court. I, I didn't even know that. And we should not be following this. And we need to get rid of these theories. The majority didn't get rid of these political process theories. Uh, they effectively said, well, we'll keep these precedents, but there has to be showing of actual racial animus, right? So if there was a showing that the people of Michigan got rid of these policies so they wanted to harm blacks and Hispanics, then it would be unconstitutional, right? If there was actually some showing of harm, Animus, hatred, then it will be unconstitutional. But if there's merely a showing that they decided to exercise their right to amend the Constitution, their state Constitution, to, to get rid of this practice which is hanging on a thread, barely constitutional, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, Justice uh, Breyer had an, 
I love Justice Breyer. He had an interesting concurrence where he basically said, I don't agree with the majority, but if the people want to change their constitution, then they should be able to, right? If there's no allegations of any kind of segregation or hatred, then they should be able to. So the vote here was actually a six to two, just as Kagan recused. Now, the thing that kept me up till midnight was the, the long dissent from Justice Sotomayor. It was 54 pages long. That, it was longer than all the other opinions combined. That doesn't usually happen. And Justice Sotomayor took the unusual step of reading her dissent from the bench. Now, you might not know what this practice is, but usually at the Supreme Court, when they announce an opinion, the author gives maybe a two or three minute summary of his opinion. And that's usually about it. But when a justice is very angry in dissent, they think it's a big deal, they'll actually read a prepared speech and why they dissent. Uh, Sotomayor, has never done, Sotomayor has never done this before in, I guess, four or five years on the bench. In fact, she gave an interview recently where she said she probably would not do it, but, but she did it, right? So why did she do it? What made her so upset? Well, a few things. So I think this is the clearest articul articulation yet of Justice Sotomayor's uh, uh, judicial philosophy. And if you read nothing else, read like the last two or three pages of it, where she says very clearly um, the role of, of judges, the role of the court, is to intervene to, how do I put this correctly? I don't, I don't want to misquote her because she phrased it very delicately. It's intervened to make sure that the political process is not restructured to disadvantage of minorities. She says judges should make sure that the majority can't change the rules of the game in the middle of the game to harm minorities. She was very, very clear about this. She... She, she traced this history, which was kind of interesting. She tried to recast the entirety of American history through this lens or this prism of political process, which was, which was I don't think, very well done, but, but she tried it. And she kept juxtaposing the majority and the minority. And she said, at one point after the 15th Amendment, the majority wanted to deny blacks the right to vote. But this court stepped in and made sure they had the right to vote. And then the majority tried to impose poll taxes literacy tests, right? Grandfather clauses. The majority did that. And, th and then the court stepped in. And then she gets this one line, I'm quoting it most verbatim from memory, the latest chapter of discrimination, the latest chapter of discrimination was in Michigan, where the majority passed this amendment. So she tries to trace, as I always say, an arc from denying blacks the right to vote to Jim Crow to the Michigan Amendment to the Constitution. She traces a direct arc. Justice Scalia freaks the hell out at this, right? He actually calls her out in a footnote, calling it shameful to tie together the people who passed this amendment to Jim Crow. Actually, he calls it doubly shameful. I think that's the exact quote, footnote 11 in his opinion, right? Doubly shameful to call them out. So he was irate. Sotomayor replies that the majority is, quote, out of touch with reality. She has to phrase shoes. They are out of touch with reality. They don't know what's going on. They don't understand affirmative action. They don't get it. The Chief Justice, who's usually very even keeled, writes a two-page concurring opinion directly responding to Sotomayor saying, hey, listen, I get that we disagree. We can have an honest debate about affirmative action, but don't call us out of touch because then you basically discard our entire argument, right? What he was implying, and this, this is my spin, maybe not what was there, but the way I read it, is that don't call us bigots. Don't call us bigots. The Chief Justice made a similar comment in the Windsor case, this is a gay marriage case from last year, where he said, just because some people, like President Clinton, oppose gay marriage, he said, quote, don't tar them with the brush of bigotry. Don't tar them with the brush of bigotry. That's what Roberts said in the Windsor case last year. And I read his opinion in the, in the Schutte case yesterday to be the exact same thing. Just because we disagree with you about affirmative action does not make us bigots. There is a fundamental divide, my friends, a fundamental divide between the majority and, and the dissent in this case. The majority views affirmative action as actually dangerous and harmful. For the reasons I talked about in Justice Thomas's dissent, where he says, leave me alone, right? That's what Frederick Douglass wrote, leave the black man alone. They believe that affirmative action is dangerous, that it actually creates racial tensions. <clears throat> it creates racial tensions, right? 
It promotes this feeling of inferiority. It should be get rid of as soon as possible. The majority firmly believes that. The dissent, to the contrary, rejects that. She thinks that affirmative action is a good thing. She said so, in her, in, uh, Justice Sotomayor has said so in her own personal capacity. Go read her book, right? She said it very clearly that affirmative action helped me get where I am, and we need to promote it. She actually sees the majority as being so out of touch that they're just, they're not even on this planet. And I, I mean, this is why Roberts, I think, freaked out at her. Because Roberts is usually even killed. He doesn't, he doesn't do stuff like that often. That's not his style. He's not Scalia. But they both made the same point. And so do I reply to this in footnote 8 of her opinion, also in footnote 1 of the opinion, where she says something to the effect of, well, I'm not saying you guys are bigoted, not, not to justice, I'm not saying that the majority of Michigan's bigoted, but I'll let the evidence speak for itself. And then she shows all these graphs and charts, which display that after this amendment was passed in, in Michigan, the percentage of black and Hispanic students at University of Michigan dropped. She includes other charts from California, which show that after Prop 209, which was effectively the same thing as, as the Michigan one, after California can no longer use affirmative action, the number of blacks and Hispanics dropped. I think we talked about it at UCLA now. There's like, what, like five black kids or something? It's like some absurdly low number. And the numbers have plummeted at uh, Michigan as well. And Sotomayor is basically like, I'm not stupid. Look, at, look what's going on here. Look who's getting impacted by these laws, right? Whether or not you have this animus, whether it's like an intentional, deliberate, discriminatory act, she doesn't care. To the extent that the majority is restructuring the process to hurt some parts of the minority, not the Asians, right? Then, then she, has, she has a problem with it. And that's when they have to step in. So this is a really, uh, I wrote like 21 blog posts about this yesterday. You can read them all. Uh, th th this, this is the summary. I got like at least 15 more today I have to finish. I think I have to read her class for today. Um, so this is a very serious case. Uh, what was most striking in my mind was that Justice Thomas didn't write separately. I can't figure that out. I've been, I've been wrapping my mind around that all day. By my count, Thomas has never avoided a case involving affirmative actions, or or in something, even you know, briefly. If I, were, I, if I were in Thomas' shoes and I read Sotomayor's opinion, I would have been furious because it's the exact opposite of what he believes. Everything that he believes affirmative action is bad, Sotomayor believes it's good, and I can't wrap my mind around why he didn't write anything. I had this fleeting thought that might be insane that he wrote it and withdrew it because it was too harsh. I had this fleeting thought, but I, 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 I don't know why I think that, but there were parts of Scalia's opinion that read like Thomas, and I think they might have just incorporated it rather than writing separately. I, I, I might be totally wrong on that one, and maybe in 50 years I'll read their papers and find out, but I don't know. I'll, I'll go back to you. <laughs> so that was the Shooty case. Um, so really a significant case. Um, it doesn't really affect much. Um, we might have more states now try to ban affirmative action. Uh, I think that's going to be the next consequence of this. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Texas has such an amendment coming up soon, which would effectively moot the Fisher case. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that happens. I, I, I think the, the, the upshot is affirmative action does not have very long legs in this country. I think its time is, uh, its time is near. Um, for better or worse, the debate will be resolved by the political process and not, not by the courts. And if uh, enough states effectively ban it, then it becomes a moot issue. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So, okay, let me explain this. There's something called a plurality, okay? On the Supreme Court, to have a majority opinion, you need five votes, okay? What happens when you have less than five, okay? They, they identify the opinion with the most votes. In this case, the opinion with the most votes was actually Justice Kennedy's opinion with three votes. It was Kennedy, Roberts, and Alito. That opinion had three votes, and that was the plurality. Scalia and Thomas concurred in the judgment, right? They concurred with the majority, but only in part. So because they didn't support the entire thing, you would say that Thomas was in the majority, but you say more precisely he joined the plurality. He, he agreed with the plurality opinion. It gets tricky when you have less than five, uh, but, but the general phrase is you have the plurality opinion, which is the three votes. So which is controlling, won't be precise, the parts where Scalia and Thomas agree with the other three. So there were parts of the opinion where Scalia and Thomas agree with the three, and in that case, there are five votes. But then Scalia goes off on his own and basically says, this is all stupid, and get rid of all these cases, and you know, don't, don't call me racist. 
Oh, and in that footnote where he's called out Soto America, he actually cited John Marshall Harlan saying that the uh, Constitution sees no colors as a colorblind Constitution. Footnote, by the way, don't compare me to Jim Crow. That was, that, that was vicious. It was, it was vicious. I've been wanting to ask you, how does the Supreme Court come to their conclusion? I mean, do they sit in a room together? Yes. Or all by themselves with their own... So, at, so the Friday after oral argument, something called a conference is held. Okay? At the conference, all of the justices basically state how they're going to vote. And I, I've heard conflicting rumors, but I think that, and I think I actually got this wrong in my book, but I've since learned that the way the Chief Justice first announces his vote, and they go down the line in succession. And they usually give a few minutes summary about why they vote each way. And at that point, uh, they know everyone voted, and an opinion is assigned. So say if the Chief Justice is in the majority, he can assign it to anyone or to himself. If the Chief Justice is in the dissent, the, the most senior Associate Justice, which now is Scalia, can assign the opinion. So, is there, do they have their aides with them, or is it closed? No, no. The, the, the conferences are closed door. No one's in there. In fact, there's a tradition that they bring food and drinks and stuff, and the, 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 uh, you know, the, wait, the waiter knocks on the door, and it's the job of the junior justice to go to the door to get the door. <laughs> and speaking of Justice Stevens, he tells, he tells a funny story. When he first joined the court, he was most junior justice. Someone was knocking on the door. He didn't know what to do, so he just sat there. <laughs> then Justice Rehnquist, who was more senior, got up and got it, gave it to him. He opened the door. Stephen said he never made that mistake ever again. Yeah, so no people are allowed in the conference. It's very secretive. But they tell the clerks about it afterwards. But it's very secretive at the time. Yeah. I'm just uh, making sure you're saying that uh, in a plurality decision, they take the, uh, the uh, most votes, they take that, uh, that rationale. <laughs> I thought that in the, in the McDonald case. So, okay, so the difference between a plurality and a 414 split, okay? So generally, a plurality... I'm getting really into the weeds here. Ignore me if you don't care about this. Generally, a plurality is when you have five votes for a specific position, right? But there's several opinions. So the, the, the main opinion that most votes is called the plurality. The 414 split is different because there are no five votes for any given position. There, you're supposed to take the most narrow rule. It's called the Marx rule. And that's why I think Thomas and Kennedy controls. But in this case, the Kennedy opinion probably controls because Scalia and Thomas agree with him on most of it. In fact, if you read the Scalia opinion, he'll begin by saying, I agree with the, the um, court's opinion, but I go further. Right? And all the further stuff is not controlling. So 414 four, four is not plurality. Well, a four, the, the, the four vote block is called the plurality of the majority, but the actual holding is determined by the Marx rule, which is the most narrow position. Ignore me. This is really in the weeds. If you want to ask me about it later, this is the things that law professors fight over for years, right? This is, this is actually Obamacare, to, to bring it to another example. In Obamacare, Right? Numbers, right? There were four votes, I'm sorry, there were five votes that the uh, Affordable Care Act violated the Commerce Clause. There were also five votes to say that it was okay under the, under the taxing power. The only person in the middle was John Roberts. So therefore that was his controlling opinion. Even though he only had to get four votes here and four votes there if he was the one in the middle. It's bizarre. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. At the time she was a Solicitor General, she probably advised in the case. She also recused in Fisher. She didn't recuse in Obamacare, though. That was the biggest BS in the world. I, I called her out on that in several blog posts in my book saying that she should have recused. So it's actually funny. She went out of her way not to be involved in this case. I went through all the emails, interviewed everyone. At one point, her deputy says, hey, General Kagan, we're having a meeting at the White House about this affordable care. you want to come? You know what her response was? What's your phone number? What's your phone number? So I've argued that you should have recused, which makes it even worse because I sent her a copy of my book and she wrote back saying, thanks, Josh, I read your blog often. I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, sure, I read your blog often. I was like, Shh. it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it, it was like, but that's how good she is. Like, she's trying to give you a compliment, but I'm like, I know. <laughs> so... <laughs> I've actually heard that most that most of them actually read my book, which is, which which is good, which, which is good. most of the justices. Yeah, I know Stevens read it, Kennedy read it, Scalia has in his chambers, and I got notes from Alito as well saying he liked. But you know, I I got enough that it, they know about it. But the one from Kagan was the best. <laughs> All right, other questions. All right, let me try and I I, I ignored most of these. Uh, oh, Justice Stevens's book. It's really bad, and I, I'm not. And don't take my word for it. I'm not a fan of his, but it's it's not very well thought out. 
he basically, t the premise of the book is, let's amend the Constitution in six ways, right? All the amendments would turn his dissents into majority opinions. This is the biggest book of sour grapes you'll ever read. It's, I was in the dissent, so let's amend the Constitution to make me right. And it's a very poorly written book because the amendments make no sense. So basically, for example, the Second Amendment, which has a well-regulated militia being necessary to secure a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, right? That's what the Second Amendment says. He wants to insert two words, or three words, in the militia, that the people in the militia have a right to bear arms. That makes no sense. Why would a soldier need a right to bear arms? Can you imagine if a commanding officer tells a soldier, give me your gun, he says, no, Second Amendment? It doesn't make any sense. It makes zero sense. Like, he can't even write the amendment that would do what he wants it to do. He's 94. I'll give him some slack, but it's a terrible book. And I'm very glad that Kate Sessor took away all the attention because it's really a bad book. You can read I've written about it at great length. I, I've actually been blogging about this for three years. People didn't believe me. I've been calling it the Stevens Rehab Tour. We are trying to rehabilitate his legacy. And finally, now the book's come out. He's like, oh, yeah, Josh was right. But I'll, I'll leave that there. Uh, yeah, that's a quote. For different reasons, left, right, we'll probably agree that Robert stepped up with reality. Uh, that may be true. The justices probably are out of touch with reality. But as far as from a collegial perspective, the justices you don't say stuff like that, right? Because that means not that you disagree, but that he's an idiot, right? There's a difference between saying, "I respect your opinion, but I don't agree with the reasoning," versus, "Man, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're out, you're, you are out of touch. You have out of touch with reality." And there, there's, a, there's a big difference. And I hope in any debate you have as a lawyer, you never use language like that. It's 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 not only disrespectful, but it it, it takes the debate to a different level, right? We can have honest disagreements. I have lots of friends who I don't agree with on much. We can have honest debates, but don't call people out of touch because that means they're just stupid. They're not taking it seriously. All right. Oh, yes, Bundy's coming to uh, Texas, right? So this this actually, <laughs> Greg Abbott, you know, is running for governor, and he basically said that there's some disputed land along the Red River, you know, Oklahoma and Texas border, and BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, is trying to assert jurisdiction. Greg Abbott said, I will take the flag of Gonzales and come and take it and plant in the Red River. I, I bet he will. That would be an awesome photo op. Um, <laughs> I don't know anything about this case. I saw that article earlier. Uh, I asked him about it next year. I'm guessing that BLM is going to take a wait-and-see approach for, them, for the time being, let things cool down, don't send any snipers to farms. I mean, that's probably their best interest. Uh, I'd be happy to sign any books you have anytime. Just bring them by. Ah, this is a good question. What is the status of affirmative action for private institutions? Okay, so if you remember in the Bakke case, a couple of the justices decide the issue based on Title VI, right? Title VI basically says if you're an educational institution and you receive any federal funding, which means all of them except if you receive any federal funding, you have to comply with the Civil Rights Act, right? What does the Civil Rights Act say? You can't discriminate on the basis of race. Okay, so that means they can't have a policy saying we won't admit black people. They, they couldn't do that policy. But what if the Supreme Court holds that affirmative action discrimination? There are four votes for that, but not five. Kennedy didn't go there. So if there are five votes to say that affirmative action discrimination, arguably, and I don't take this position, I just I had this debate last night with a friend, arguably, private institutions can't use affirmative action. This didn't come up in the litigation, but Harvard actually submitted an amicus brief in the Michigan case saying, hey, this might impact us. Ah, but now there's actually a lawsuit in the works by the same guy from Texas who wrote Fisher, right? The same guy who put the Fisher case together named Ed Bloom. He is going to challenge Harvard's policy. He's going for it. He's going for it. He's going to take down private institutions. So if that flies, all private colleges may now be bound and they can't use affirmative action. Imagine that. I, I had this debate last night with a, with a professor friend, uh, and I don't, I don't agree with his reading. He reads it that the private colleges would not be able to use affirmative action. I don't know that I agree with him, but it's still live. Okay. Uh, Stephen Colbert, what do you say? Former Justice Stevens proposed six changes to the Constitution. I've got two. No changes, more guns. Yes, good old, good old Colbert. Is his show still on? or, or I mean, when's, it, when's he transitioning? I don't even know. Next year? Uh, I don't watch that. Yeah. Is uh, the private institution, uh, they get uh, uh, tax-free exemption? 
most most universities will get a tax free exemption. Yes. Okay. Is that considered in itself a federal aid? I mean, it's kind of indirect. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, no, no. It's specifically do your students receive financial aid? Are there any federal grants funding your research? I mean, virtually every school in the country except for Hillsdale, which is in Michigan, accepts some form of federal aid. Hillsdale does it because they don't want to be bound by these rules. They say, screw it. You don't accept federal loans. Your money's not good here. Bob Jones, which is a case I mentioned also, they had the policy where um, uh, they wouldn't let interracial students date. And actually, in that case, they were threatened to lose their tax exempt status over it. And the Supreme Court said, if you want your tax exempt status, you have to abide by this rule. Yeah, the Bob Jones case. Yep. What else? What else? What's on your mind? Good? Read, if you can read anything, try to read the, uh, the first few pages of the Sotomayor dissent, maybe the end of her dissent. Read most of Scalia's opinion. It's just very well written. And maybe the Chiefs. The majority you can skip. It, it's Kennedy babble. I mean, it, there's good stuff in there, but it's not very interesting. Yeah. Like they claim, you know, their religious interests and stuff. How do you sort of counterbalance the issues of race and religion? Which one trumps? I guess race trumps religion. Well, what are you are you asserting that people have religious interests to discriminate? No, but they had some sort of I don't know what religion they were some sort of religion religious belief in the Bible. That people should not yeah, intermarry. I, I don't think it was based on animus as a Maybe well, I mean, that, that, that's a good question. What happens if religion dictates HB that you should discriminate? What happens if religion says you can't marry outside your race? Your race? So what? <coughs> Depends who you ask. I, I think every court which is considered a religious challenge to Title VII, which is you can't discriminate as laws, right? That every court's consistently said you do not have a religious right to discriminate based on race, but a religious right to discriminate based on sexual orientation or gay marriage. That was the Elaine Photography case that Supreme Court declined to review. So I'll let you decide for yourselves. I don't, I am, I, I that's an issue I'm still thinking through. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm very much conflicted on that issue. What else? Oh, I've been talking so much, my tablet shut off. Okay. Let's talk about free speech. Okay? Free speech? Free speech. I, I, prim, I won't drop, oh, I already dropped an F-bomb. I won't drop any more F-bombs. I'm done. <laughs> That, that wasn't delivered, actually, the Kagan, but it was okay. So we have a number of cases today on the First Amendment, and I, I apologize I have to cramp so much in, but I want you to have this knowledge when you go forth and conquer and try and do great things. So we were talking in the last class about one of the threshold inquiries for any free speech question, right? Is this speech? Just because I'm talking doesn't mean it's, you know, speech. If I'm saying you goddamn fascist, you damn racketeer, those were called fighting words. Fighting words. Someone want to punch me in the face. That is not protected speech. If I film child pornography, the Supreme Court has said that's not speech. That's obscenity. Right? That 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 is no scientific or literary value. That is just obscene. If I threaten someone, right, I say. I'm going to kill you. That's not protected speech. I could be prosecuted for making a threat. What if I make false statements? Right? What if I lie about someone? Well, in the New York Times or Sullivan case, he said, well, that might be speech because we want people to criticize others and you make a mistake. So the court's precedents have been very protective of free speech. There have been very few of these exceptions crafted. Very few of these exceptions. SupremeCourt.gov, right? SupremeCourt.gov. You can find the opinion. Okay. So there were a couple of cases in the last few years that were on point. One I signed, the other I didn't bother signing. The first one was called United States versus Stevens. No, not, no relation to Justice Stevens. Okay. This involved, I mentioned last time, crush films, right? God, what are crush films? I told you. It's a fetish where women in high heels stomp on cute furry animals. Don't Google it. Don't let me Google it for you. Do not Google it. I, I take my word for it, right? Congress passed a law that banned the sale of crush films. Okay? And Congress effectively argued that this is obscenity. 
that this has no scientific, literary, or cultural value, that this is just effed up. I told you one curse again, right? That this is just this is this is totally beyond the pale. All right. Supreme Court, was it 9-0 or 8 to 1? It was, it was a huge verdict, struck it down. They said, this is not obscene. While we may not agree with this as a form of, I don't know, recreation, whatever you want to call it, some people may. And we're not prepared to create a new class of unprotected speech. All right, so that, that was that was a Stevens case. I think that was 2010 or 11, I can't remember the year. These are cases I remember reading when they first came out, so the, the year isn't quite as important. I was, a lot, I was around for that, so the last couple of years. The next case that came out was originally called Schwarzenegger versus EMA. And I am so mad that Arnold was not on the caption. Because you've had Schwarzenegger versus EMA, so now it's all with Brown. Governor Jerry Brown, one of the boring names. He's Schwarzenegger, right? And, and there's a certain irony here that Schwarzenegger was opposing violence. <laughs> Has he ever, ever seen his movies? <laughs> Has he even seen his own movies? Maybe not. I don't know. But but the governor uh, signed into law the, 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 this this act that would have effectively prohibited people under the age of eighteen from buying violent video games without a parent. Now you might ask, wait a minute, Josh, don't all the video games have ratings already? They're voluntary. There's no requirement under law that stores was it not seventeen whatever the age limit. There's no requirement that stores. Advised by them. They're effectively advisory, meaning the video game industry has self-regulated. Imagine that. An industry self-regulates to keep dangerous things out of kids' hands. I'll give you one else. Is it a crime for a movie theater to admit a child to an R movie? Is it a crime for a movie theater to admit an NC-17 movie for a toddler? No. It's purely advisory. The, the Motion Picture Association of America, uh, was it the ESA, the electronic, you know, the rating system, it's all advisory. What California did was they made it into a law that was actually a crime, right, for a video game seller to sell these games to a child under the age of, was it 18 or 17, whatever it was. It's a crime, unless a parent's present. If the parent's present, they, they, they can sell it to them. One side note. Does anyone know the name Leland Yi? That name ring a bell for anyone. So this was a senator who actually uh, proposed this law in California. He was very big on, on, on video game violence. This dude just got indicted for being an arms trafficker. He was basically routing guns to, oh, God, what country? What country was it? Was it, was it Vietnam or Korea? I can't remember. Someone Google it. Lee Lin Yi. He was basically funneling guns to all these insurgent groups overseas. And this is a guy who introduces the law to ban video game violence. So him and Schwarzenegger, I'm sure, were you know, hunting buddies or something, right? It's whatever. California. So what happens? Supreme Court, by a vote of 7 to 2, Right, seven to two. This one was not even close. About seven to two, the Supreme Court invalidated this law. Okay, so there were a lot of arguments about violent video games. Does people like video games in here? People play them. I was always so bad at them, never got into them. I just, I, I have no hand-eye coordination. I can't, like, I, I couldn't even do Nintendo. I, I gave up. I gave up when I was like six. Like, screw this. But I've seen these video games, and they are very violent. So to give you an example, Portal Two. You know about that game? So, and there's uh, Grand Theft Auto, a couple other games. There was one mention in Breyer's Descent, which you may, I don't know if they cut it out of the book, where there's a game which involves, and again, we are talking reality, where you, t you bind a woman, no, you kidnap her, bind her up, urinate on her, torture her, then light her on fire. I think I got that the right order right. So that's out the urination. I said urination. No, it, 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 it. They, they left everything but the urination part? No, they put bound, gag, tortured, and killed. Oh, they cut out the urination part? Mm -hmm. I got I, I got checked. I might be mixing this up. Someone check the actual opinion. I know the word urine's in there somewhere. Someone check the Google that for me because I... That's not good. <laughs> anyway, but these are some really messed up video games, right? These are some very dangerous images. Oh, Philippines, yes, that's right. These are some very dangerous images. And there's a significant body of psychological research showing that these video games mess people up. They, they, they put evil ideas into their minds. And in fact, some people tried to link uh, mass shootings at Columbine and elsewhere to, to violent video games and Marilyn Manson and The Matrix and I don't know what else, what else right? So there's an overwhelming body of psychological literature saying it's bad to have these games with children. 
So Leland Yi, Mr. Philippine Gunrunner, right? What's he decide to do? Let's ban the sale of games to these children. Okay. So there's one precedent in the books which which is relevant called uh, uh, Ginsburg, uh, G D E R G, not like the justice, and this law effectively said that uh, New York could ban the sale of nudie magazines to minors. <laughs> nudie magazines, like before the internet, right? That minors in New York could not buy, you know, Playboy or whatever. G girly magazines, they were called. So, if that precedent's on the book, you know, of course the state can ban it. Right? Madden. I was really bad at video games. So, right, so if the state can ban the sale of nudie magazines, why can't they ban the sale of video games that are violent? Well, the court in my estimation, doesn't really deal with that precedent while they kind of ignore it, which is what they usually do. But what Scalia says effectively is that video games are no different than books. Huh? He says video games are no different than books. They have stories, they have plots, they have character development, and like the best books, the best video games are interactive. They draw you in. They immerse you in this world. And I hope and pray all of you read some book at this time, at some point in your life, where you read it and you felt like you were there. Right? You felt like you were in the story. You felt like you were one of the characters. You felt like you could choose where you were going. You are those choose your own adventure books. Remember those? He mentions those in the opinion. You can choose your own adventure. And Scalia says, if that's the case, we've had a lot of violent books. For example, has anyone ever read the Brothers Grimm, the original stuff? It's messed up. Like, I'll give you an example. The original Cinderella story, when one of the uh, uh, stepsisters tries to put her foot in the, in, the, in the sandal, it doesn't fit, she cuts off a toe. The other one cuts off a heel to try and put her foot in. These are really gruesome, violent stories, right? Go, go read the, uh, oh, God, the, the original Sleeping Beauty. Whew. The prince rapes her while she's sleeping, and she has a child, and when she wakes up, she gives birth. No, she, she, gives, she wakes up because she gave birth. <laughs> There's actually a thing on BuzzFeed of like the Disney stories, you don't want to know the true stories. Yeah, right? They're, they're, not, they're not good. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I saw that, I think. Grim, right? It's called Grim? I saw it years ago. It wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah. I uh, think it's psychology matrix. Yes. So one of the key aspects, though, is that when the parents aren't involved in these decisions, they wanted to make sure the parent was one buying uh, the, these video games. But but Scalia says, you know what? Video games are just like books. They're like plays. They're like movies. And as violent as they are, they're protected. It's funny during arguments, uh, Kagan made a joke about Mortal Kombat, and Scalia never heard of it. And then she's like, "Ask your clerks." <laughs> she's awesome. Okay. So. Once you establish that these violent BTK you know, video games are, are, are really speech, then the inquiry becomes very easy. And this is, the, this is the gist of what I want to convey for today, is the court has to make a threshold decision. Right? Once you decide it's speech, the next question is, is it based, I'm sorry, is the regulation based on the content or is it content neutral? Right? First, is it based on the content of the speech? Or second, is it content neutral? What do I mean by that? Well, well, you'll see in the later cases that a lot of laws are content neutral. For example, the draft card burning case, right? Congress banned the, the burning of the draft card not because they want to uh, uh, you know, censor the speech, because they want people to keep their draft cards, that it was a useful document to have. But in the video game case, Justice Scalia found that this is a restriction based on speech, on the content of the speech. They're not regulating everything. They don't regulate Sunday morning cartoons, right? They don't regulate movies. They don't regulate the sale of music. They don't regulate the sale of violent DVDs. All they're regulating is video games based on the content of these video games, based on that rating, right? And Scalia says this is clearly a content-based regulation. Don't get that. Okay. So that initial decision of whether it's content-based or content-neutral is so important because of the level of scrutiny, right? You thought we were done with scrutiny, right? You thought we were done with it. So I'm going to mess you up even more, okay? 
if a regulation is content-based, if the government's regulating based on the contents of the speech, you apply strict scrutiny. Regulations based on the contents of speech apply strict scrutiny. Okay. Regulations that are content neutral apply intermediate scrutiny. If it's not based on the content, if it's content neutral, you apply intermediate scrutiny. Okay. Now, to make your lives even more difficult, in the context of free speech, the tests for strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny are different than for equal protection. Wouldn't that be easy, right? Intermediate scrutiny means the same thing for gender as it does for content neutral speech? No, no, they're different. And we'll do this for the O'Brien case in a few minutes. Okay. So, easier though for you is strict scrutiny. So, the court defines strict scrutiny, which is pretty much similar to protection, but not exactly, as uh, you need to have a compelling government interest, and it's narrowly drawn. So, that one's pretty similar, right? You have to have a compelling governmental interest, and it has to be narrowly drawn. The rule of thumb is that any restriction based on the content of the speech, so any content-based restriction, is presumptively unconstitutional. Presumptively. It almost no law will ever, I mean, I should say no, but virtually no law will ever survive strict scrutiny if it's content-based. Okay, I want to get that. So with the court, yes? Not really. It's, it's effectively the same thing. So, I mean, that's why I said it's pretty close. Intermediate, though, is quite different, but the strict scrutiny is pretty close. Okay? So, the court in EMA, in Brown, EMA is an Electronics Merchants Association, whatever it stands for. Okay? I was so mad when they renamed the case Brown. I was, like, so, so high for a Schwarzenegger case, but, uh, because then it would remember it, because Schwarzenegger violence, then it would remember the name. It would be an apt name, right? An apt name is an appropriate name, so it's an apt name. It's apt. So Scalia applies strict scrutiny, and unsurprisingly, the government loses, right? Why does the government lose? Because California psychological research, all these volumes of books and studies done, are not good enough. They're not good enough. Why? Because free speech is so damn important that the potential of maybe messing up some kid's psyche is not good enough. You need to show there's an actual harm being fixed. And for Scalia, so social science research is not enough. Contrast that with Brown v. Board. Remember that footnote? Where social science research, hot damn, resolved everything. That's it. Psychologists tell us it's good to have integrated schools, equal protection. Look how far we've come. In dissent, Justice Breyer, who loved social science research, he'll tell you about it all day long, or in his years. He includes this lengthy dissent, none of which was in the record, of course. I wrote an op-ed an op criticizing at the time about this. He wrote this lengthy op-ed, effectively saying that we have all this data, right? All this data showing that these video games are bad for people. Let California decide how to manage their children. Don't Courts should not be intervening here. Let, let California decide. Okay? Let California decide for themselves. Breyer is probably one of the least protective justices of free speech. And I talked about this with his McCutcheon dissent, but he has not viewed free speech as a liberty interest unto itself. He only views free speech as worthwhile so, so long as it serves some sort of collective good. He has a very narrow view of free speech. In fact, I wrote an op-ed at the time, which is probably should have written, called Oliver Wendell Breyer. <laughs> I got in trouble for that one. But I basically compared Holmes' narrow view of liberty to Breyer. I, I firmly believe that he tries to emulate him. Let the democratic process rule. Let them go to hell. I'll help them get there. That Breyer voted 
to uphold this law in Michigan, which he probably hated, is proof of that. He believes in democratic rule. He voted to uphold the, the shooting case, right? The Michigan one. He hates that law. He can't possibly like it, but he believes firmly in people should be able to pass laws they want to accomplish certain ends, unless it's abortion. Then it's out of the question. But for everything else, I'm slightly joking there. For everything else, the people should decide. Yep. And Justice Alito concurred with the Chief Justice, and they were on a similar wavelength as Breyer. They said, listen, we agree that this law is probably too broad and it's unconstitutional and violates the freedom of speech, but we shouldn't be so um, quick to second-guess social science research, right? We shouldn't be so quick to tell Californians they can't protect their children. You know, think of the children. Someone, well, someone, please think of the children. Like, you know, Helen Lovejoy in this, on The Simpsons, right? Someone, please think of the children. Okay? Justice Thomas, fascinating, thinks that children have zero rights. None. Zip zero. There's a bomb kit for Jesus case a couple years ago, which is not in your book. But uh, in Alaska, during an Olympic procession where they're carrying the torch, uh, these, these idiot kids unfurled a banner that said, Bong hits for Jesus. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. You can use your imaginations, right? And they were suspended. They were disciplined. And the Supreme Court basically held that they were outside school. It was, it was, you know, it was a school-sanctioned activity, so they have free speech rights. Justice Thomas dissented, saying, nah, kids have no rights. That historically, a common law, the kids were effectively the, not quite property, but the wards of their parents. And it's purely for the parents to decide what they do. And I, he, he, he believes that firmly. So kids, you have no rights with Uncle, Uncle Clarence. You know, you have zero rights, so make sure you behave. Um, one other case to mention, which uh, might have been the reading, is Tinker versus uh, Des Moines School District. So this was a case from the uh, 1960s in the Vietnam era where you had these two uh, uh, students came to school wearing black armbands. And this was seen as a form of protest against the war in Vietnam. And they were suspended. Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You can engage in free speech in schools. You do not shed your First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gates. You do not shed your rights to free speech when you enter the school. But if your behavior causes some sort of disruption, they can punish you. So this is why whenever you have any kind of uh, discipline involving a speech issue, they always say, well, were they actually disrupting the classroom? And this, this, this area of law has been all over the place. Where I've seen schools, you know, suspend kids for stuff they put on Facebook because they say it's a disruption in the classroom. Not agreeing with that. All right. So that is uh, that is Brown v. EMA. Any questions on the on the video game the video violent video game violence case? Yes. Uh, I'll tell the name. Uh, Morsi Frederick. Okay. So the question here was. Was Brown v. EMA holding as the ends or the means of the Constitution? Uh, both. Actually, more, more the end. Nah, okay, the means. I'll say the means, right? The reason why Scalia says this wasn't narrowly tailored enough, he says it's important to try to protect children. That, that, that's a valid interest. But the means you chose to get there were not very well narrowly, were not narrowly tailored. Why? You didn't regulate music? You didn't regulate videos or movies? You didn't regulate like downloads. There are all these other aspects of violence which you didn't touch, which makes you think that you were focusing only on the content of the video game, and that is a no-no. I don't know what that case is. Dariano versus Morganelle. I have no idea what that case is. Stop me for once. No idea. Yeah. Would that be worse? So, so there's something called under-inclusiveness and over-inclusiveness, which is a trap, right? This law was under-inclusive. It didn't include enough, right? But say if they ban everything, it'll be over-inclusive. This is why strict scrutiny is a trap, right? Once you get in there, you lose. The threshold decision of whether you apply intermediate or strict is the ball game. Once you decide is this content neutral or not, you know how this case is going to end. It's very similar to equal protection. If you have a suspect class like race, you know how this one's going to end, unless it's affirmative action. Okay. Questions? Okay. Let's talk about content neutral. So, very often, the government will pass various laws that 
indirectly limit free speech. So, for example, has anyone ever been involved in a public parade? You have to apply for a permit, right? Right? You have to go to the city and apply for a permit? Okay. Does that violate your First Amendment rights? If I want to go and march down, you know, Fannin Street in the middle of the day, or Main Street in the middle of the day, wave banners saying, you know, overturn Wicked be Filburn, right? Can I, can I do that? Okay. There were, there, I've, seen, I've seen that sign of protest, by the way. You know, overturn Wicked be Filburn, can I do that? Well, no, they'll arrest you for trespassing. They'll arrest you for stopping traffic. They'll arrest you for causing a disturbance of the peace. If you go to the city and you seek a permit for a parade down Main Street on a Sunday, they say, well, you can't do it on this Sunday, but we have an opening in three months, and we'll give you two hours to do it. Say, nonsense. Wicked and Philip Burns bad. We need to get rid of it now. I'm not going to wait three months. You go there and you protest anyway. Can they arrest you? Yeah. And they say, listen, listen, guy, we'll give you your permit. Just pay this fee and go this specific day. Just, and you don't listen. Was this guy's right to the First Amendment violated? Supreme Court has said, no, emphatically not. Okay. So the first question, when they're handing out permits, do they consider the subject of the parade? No. They don't care if I'm trying to overturn Wicker v. Filburn or you know, overturn Obamacare, overturn Roe v. Wade, whatever. They don't care. So once they decide that they're not looking at the subject or the contents of my speech, we go to the intermediate scrutiny route. Right? And we ask three, three questions, right? Is this neutral with respect to time, place, and manner? Right? In other words, as long as it's neutral on the subject, they can regulate the time you do it, the place you do it, and the manner in which you do it. Right? In other words, the government doesn't have to let you speak wherever they want, but they have to do it in some of a neutral way. So say I want to say, you know, <clears throat> I want to have a protest on I-610, entire loop, close it. Entire loop, close it. Wickery Filburn's really bad. Right? I gotta get rid of it. They'll say, how about we'll give you some space in Herman Park? No, I want the entire loop. Okay. Well, that's a reasonable place regulation. They say you can do it in this one spot, in the public, people can walk up to you, fine. Right? We say, okay, fine, give me Herman Park, but Shut down for 48 hours so we have a massive vigil, right? A massive vigil in Herman Park to get rid of the aggregation principle in the Commerce Clause. We get rid of, you know, we need, we need to get rid of Wickard. They'll say, we'll give you an hour. That's enough to get your message out. They're like, no, I need 48 hours. Is there a problem there? No, that's fine because they're regulating the, the time, like how much time you're given. And that, that's, that's a fairly, you know, reasonable request. There are lots of people competing for a limited number of spaces, and the government can decide. And say, fine, we'll give you an hour in Herman Park. Say, okay, fine. I want to bring 500 loudspeakers so that everyone in the Houston area can hear me. Like, no, you can have one microphone and a megahorn, right? That's it. You get one microphone, we'll rent it to you at a, at a, at a nominal cost. Like, no, I don't want to bring my, my sound equipment. I want to blast the entire Houston area. Is that guy's first amendment rights violated? No, they regulated the, the manner, right? The manner in which you speak. So the guy, instead of shutting down 610 for four, four days, he now has Herman Park for an hour with the microphone. Okay. Can he still speak? Can he still express his message? Yes, perhaps not as long or as loud or as wide of a space you'd want to. This is what time, place, manner regulations mean. And this happens all the time when you try to speak in public. If you try to get a parade permit, uh, you know, if, if you try to uh, give any kind of public protest, every parade you see goes through serious permitting processes. And they, you have to go through them. You have to pay the various fees. Okay. So everyone get the general gist of time, place, and manner, what that means. Mm -hmm. Now recall, though, you only get this time, place, manner deal if it's content neutral. If it's content neutral. If it's content based, if they're, if they're saying, nah, you know, we like Wicker v. Filburn, so instead of Herman Park, you can go down to, you know, some, you know, the bayou. What? Right? Herman Park? They cannot judge based on the content. So this is why it often comes up that various protests will say, oh, we were denied a permit based on what we wanted to pr pr parade about. This is why you have cases like Skokie, Illinois. Everyone know about Skokie? 
It's a very Jewish community, lots of Jewish people there, lots of Holocaust survivors there. So what do the, what do the Nazis decide to do? Hold a parade in Skokie. So the, so the Nazi, uh, the neo-Nazi skinheads, KKK, whatever you want to call them, they decided to have a protest in Skokie, Illinois. They were granted a permit, but after some fighting, a lot of people said we should not be granting them a permit. Why? Because of their views, which are hateful. This is a case that really decides which line you want. Are you in favor of free speech, or are you just pretend to when it's convenient? And they, they paraded. And this actually divided the ACLU in various ways. Like we, should not be promoting, we should not promote hate speech, right, or whatever, whatever hate speech is, but you're still judging based on the content. So they paraded. And now we use this as an example of probably the right decision, although I had humbly submit that if anyone was in Skokie, they should have gone there and had a counter-protest and made loud noise even louder. Another case I cited recently is Snyder versus Phelps. Yes? In that case, like, why didn't the whole fighting voice thing come up? They weren't inciting anything. They were, they were marching with signs quietly. You know, Heil Hitler, whatever, right? But, you know, they, they, they weren't inciting. They're very deliberate. So you saw my next sentence, which is Snyder versus Phelps. This is the funeral protest case, right? You've seen the signs. I won't say God hates, right? You've seen the signs. They would do this deliberately to piss people off, right? They, they would protest at the funerals of slain soldiers. That was their mission. They view that because gays are allowed to exist, that we're going to hell, Sodom and Gomorrah is going to come back. You know, they, they have this really effed up vision. By the way, Fred Phelps, he died a few weeks ago. And a number of, uh, you know, a number of gay groups protested at his funeral. I, 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 don't, I don't like that. I don't, don't fight fire with fire. But other people, like, hell, they actually built um, a, a, like a, a gay resource center across the street from this church, which is really funny. See these rainbow flags flying across the church. It's really funny. So what did the Supreme Court say in the Snyder versus Phelps case? It's not fighting words. They're not inciting violence. The, the law is unconstitutional. They can protest there. Now, I'm sure you've seen them waving around the signs, but they answer Melissa's question. They're silent. They don't say a word. In fact, they're very deliberate. They go there, they wave their flags, take some pictures, and they go away. In fact, the day of Matthew uh, Snyder's uh, funeral, they were about 500 feet away. The family didn't even know they were there until they saw the local news. So there was really no harm. They were very, they're, they're very deliberate. In fact, uh, Fred Phelps' daughter, Marjorie Phelps, argued at the Supreme Court. She was a lawyer. She was terrible, but she argued at the Supreme Court her own case, which is fairly rare. Anyway, okay, so where was I? So, yeah, so Snyder v. Phelps, or back to O'Brien. So the facts of O'Brien. You might know that there was a draft. I hope, as everyone in this room of the male uh, persuasion registered for selective service, except for you, you, is there selective service in Canada? You have to register for a draft when you turn 18. No, not the Mounties, RCMP. No, Mounties is the federal police. Yeah, the RCMP, I like them. Like, I, like Dudley Durrett. Yeah, it's like uh, Pharrell's hat. Like yeah, no, I know. Yeah, yeah they, they actually have maple leaf stenciled onto the, on the horse's uh, butt. If you go to Ottawa, yeah, they, they, on, the, on the horse's butt, they have, like, you know, a stenciled in maple leaf on their, on their butt. No, no, it wasn't brand like They basically, like, like trimmed the horse, or they, they brushed the hair differently. You shave it. Okay, you shave it. I, I, don't, know. I don't know horses. I, I don't know, okay, but there was, there was a maple leaf in the horse's butt, whatever, I saw it. I was there, I was like, it seemed good at the time. Where was I? So O'Brien, the draft, the draft. So during the 1960s and really to this day, when any male American citizen turns to the age of 18, he's required to register with the Selective Service. The reason why you're required to register is in the, in the event of some sort of natural disaster or war, the president can actually activate and call you into military service. Now, we've talked about this before, and whether this violates the 13th Amendment. I think it's an open question, but the Supreme Court it says it doesn't, so I, I won't leave that there. Justice Douglas' dissent, <laughs> oh, Justice Douglas, he basically said that the draft was basically unconstitutional. Let me, tell you something else. Let me tell you something else about Justice Douglas. During the war in Vietnam, President Nixon ordered a bombing raid of Cambodia. Okay? Lawyers walked into federal court in New York saying that that bombing raid was unconstitutional because there was no, act, uh, no declaration of war. A district judge actually said that it was unconstitutional. A district judge in New York tried to stop a bombing raid during the middle of the Vietnam War. Okay? Appealed. The Court of Appeals stated they stopped it. Okay? Then they appealed to the Supreme Court. Justice Thurgood Marshall, who was, the, who was you know, the Circuit Justice for New York, Second Circuit, said, this is stupid. We're not going to take this case. Then Justice Douglas himself granted it. Justice Douglas unilaterally granted an order 
to stop the bombing raid in Cambodia. He's nuts. He's nuts. After one of his colleagues denied it, the practice is only the entire court does it. But the lawyers went to him specifically. Then the other eight justices basically reversed him the next day, saying, you're insane. So, so that's Justice Douglas. Yeah. A political question? Of course it's a political question. Whether to, issue a, whether to, to, to engage in a bombing run <laughs> in the middle of a war, he was nuts. This was a guy who had like six wives from secretaries. He, he was crazy. This was Penumbra's emanations guy, to give you a sense. This is, uh, this is Griswold. So, but the majority had a different set of facts. Okay? O'Brien decided to go to the steps of the Boston Courthouse, take his draft card. It was like a two-by-three index card with, you know, has his name on it. Tells him, you know, you have to keep this card at all times. If something happens, you have to go to this office, report any changes of addresses. You know, a little index card, right? He goes there, and he burns it. Okay? What happens when he burns it? Boston's strong. They start mobbing him, right? Right? They basically start beating the crap out of him. So the police officers, no, the FBI agents, they take him inside the courthouse, and they arrest him. Okay? At the time, there was a law that said it's illegal to desecrate or mutilate or obliterate or whatever it's phrased, a uh, draft card called certificate, but it's a draft card. He admitted that he did it, but he said he did it as a form of public protest. Right? What do you mean as a form of public protest? He wanted to convey to others that the draft was evil, and he wanted to use the burning of this draft card as a, as a form of expression. He wanted to actually express his uh, disgust at the war to others by burning the very symbol of the draft. My, it was what we might call symbolic speech. Now you might say, Josh, how was that speech? He didn't say a word. Well, the Supreme Court's held that conduct can be speech. It's called expressive conduct. When I engage in conduct, such as burning a draft card or perhaps burning a flag, I'm not just lighting a match and putting it to a piece of paper. I'm sending a message, right? It's mixed. There's some message and there's some conduct. Okay? So he argued this is expressive conduct. Strict scrutiny applies. You can't convict me. The Supreme Court disagrees with this, right? The Supreme Court says that this is a content-neutral regulation. The Supreme Court says Congress didn't ban the desecration of these cards based on the First Amendment rights. It banned it for procedural reasons. Congress said it's important for people to keep these cards so we know their names, we know their addresses. Right? If something happens to them, we can find them. If perhaps uh, an officer comes up to them, they can easily ascertain, is this person registered? This is before computers. So there were effectively a lot of really good reasons why Congress could enact this law that had nothing to do with the contents of the speech. Now, did you ask this question? Oh, no. I just know if you're a Canadian citizen, you don't have to register. Yeah, no. I mean, we, you know, you saw a South Park movie went out. That, that wouldn't be good. Uh, yeah. But th th this comment, I think, is right on. Like, gee, thanks. Thanks for reminding me. So if any of you who are reading this, you might have been saying, this is not the real reason Congress enacted this law, right? If you destroy any piece of government paper, they'll mail you a new one. Right? I mean, there were no computers, but, I mean, you could retrieve another one. What O'Brien said is the real reason why they passed this law had absolutely nothing to do with these administrative reasons. The reason why Congress passed this amendment, which was a passed thing in 1965, was to go after people who were dishonoring the draft. There's been a long history in this country, as you saw with the other cases, of basically arresting people who opposed the draft. Because you can imagine during a time of war where you need to put people into the army, if people start disobeying, you get screwed very quick, right? This is almost Bundy-esque. So the, so the Selective Service says, we want to send you to Korea. We want to send you to Vietnam. We want to send you to Cambodia. And you say, no. Okay, they arrest you, right? They go to this guy. We want to send you to Germany. It's like, no. So you arrest him. What happens if 1,000 people say no, right? 5,000 people, 10,000 people. You're screwed. So this is why the draft has to be so strongly regulated. This is why during World War I, anyone who even spoke out against the draft was arrested because you couldn't possibly have this dissent because the entire uh, uh, military would fall apart. If you thought seizing the steel mill 
was necessary to keep the war effort up in, in, the, in the Youngstown case. Imagine not having enough bodies to go fight, not having enough men to go to war. Now, the, um, the, the uh, what do you call it, the legislative history of the law, which is mentioned in the, in the other opinion, makes it clear that this law was introduced to stop draft car burning. Right? They said, we need a re an answer to those who make a mock your efforts in Vietnam. Another senator said this is a form of treason. So you have basically a senator saying it's treason to burn your draft card. Did that fact make it to majority opinion? No. Why? Well, they weren't really applying strict scrutiny. Right? They weren't looking at the actual purpose of what Congress is doing. They weren't looking under the hood, if you will. Instead, they said... This law is based purely on content-neutral reasons to uh, make sure people don't lose their cards. Okay. Uh, there's a question here. What case side the draft was constitutional? I can't remember the name. It was like a late 1890s or early 20th century case involving the 13th Amendment. I can't, I can't remember the name. Sorry. I'll look up later. So O'Brien gives us this four-factor pan-the-neck test. This is now so common, it's just called the O'Brien test. That's a, it, everyone knows what it is now. Okay, so what what is this test? Okay, well, of course, there have to be four factors. So the first factor says, is this within the power of the government to do? Just kind of a silly question, because they have power to do just about anything in 1965. But is this in the government's power? Well, yeah. The government has the power to raise armed forces. That's right there in the Constitution. And I think there's actually a decent argument that the power to raise a Constitution means you have the power to conscript people. I think that's actually a decent argument. Right? So if you need to raise an army, people might say no. You bring them on. Very similar to jury service. If you have a right to trial by jury, where are you getting jurors from? you got to make them do it by act of law. So I think that, that, that one's easy. Right, so one is, is it in the government's power? The second one looks at, does this further an important or substantial government interest? Does it further an important or substantial government interest? The answer to this question also is easy, I think. Yeah, you're in the middle of a war. You're fighting a foreign nation, right? Or nations. You need bodies. You need people to fight. So I think that, that, that one's kind of easy. The primary one is three and four, right? The third and fourth of the are the big biggies. So the third one says, um, is the government interest unrelated to the suppression of free expression? Is the government interest unrelated to the suppression, uh, suppression of free expression? In other words, is this law aimed at suppressing speech, or is this law have another purpose? What is the real purpose for this law? Shutting people up or making sure people have their change of addresses, right? Is the purpose of this law to punish draft card burners or to make sure that people, you know, have, have documentation on them at all times? This is usually where the case is decided on this third test. And what does a court find here? This was not about suppressing speech. This was about maintaining bureaucracy. Right? This is about maintaining people having paperwork on them, which seems almost stupid. Right? Is there any other government document that you go to jail for burning? Of course not. Of course not. Maybe a flag, perhaps. We'll do that later. But usually, you don't go to jail for burning a government document. If I want to burn my 1040, and we follow the taxes on time, I hope, then I can do it. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, after District of Columbia v. Heller was decided in my in my youth, I took a copy of Justice Breyer's Descent to the Range, and I hung it up on the bulletin board at school. No one knew what it was. No one even figured out what, what I did. But uh, that was expressive speech. I was making a point. And I tried actually aiming for certain words, but my aim wasn't that good, so I failed. But I tried, but I, I couldn't. Hey, I hit the, hit the paper, but I could, my aim wasn't that good. So... Actually, try them. Try aiming for a specific word on a piece of paper, like 10 feet. It's not, not easy. Maybe it is for some people. Not the handgun. So, four, though. The fourth one 
asks about the you know the, the the burden, right? Is this restriction on free speech, you know, greater than necessary? Right? How much of a burden? How much of a burden is this law? Right on free speech. The, does this stifle his message? Right. So what do the court say here? The court said there are plenty of other ways that he can oppose the draft. He could wave his draft card around. He can say, you know, fuck the draft. We did that case last night. Sorry, I didn't mean to, but he can, he can say that. He can do various things to oppose the draft. This is only one thing that's taken away from him. So because there are other possible avenues of him opposing the draft and the war, the burden is negligible, right? He chose the one thing he couldn't do. Would he have been arrested for talking about the draft? No. Would he have been arrested for, for criticizing the draft? Not in 1965, maybe in World War One, but he did the one thing he wasn't supposed to do. He burned the draft card, and that that that's what that's what killed him. That's that's what got him in trouble. Everyone okay with that? So that's his four pack four factor. This is the O'Brien test, okay? And you, we're going to apply this test whenever there's a content neutral regulation of speech. Whenever they're only regulating the time, place, or manner, not, they're not judging the content, we apply O'Brien. All right. Questions on the, on the O'Brien case? Okay. Yes? Why does the Supreme Court pretend that it was about something else? Why did they... I, uh, I, I don't know. They usually don't. Um, I think this was at a time when the, when, the, when the draft was fairly new and they didn't quite know what was going on. And I think the Cohen versus California case with the fuck the draft guys came later. I don't know. I mean, the, the justices, they, they basically closed their eyes to what this actually was. This, was. this was clearly a law passed to punish a very specific act. And it's the exact opposite of what they did in the, in the, the flag burning case that we're going to read next, right? Oh, I'll, I'll save that for when I talk about the Texas case. Any questions about O'Brien, about the test, about the factors? All right, so uh, this was 1965, O'Brien. Then we get to 1989, when I hope maybe most people were born, I think, uh, where we get to Texas versus Johnson. Texas versus Johnson. I always find it funny that only primary schools have American flags in the room. I don't know. I guess it's not a thing. So, in 1984, the uh, Republican National Convention was holding its uh, convention in Dallas. And you had this guy, Mr. Mr. Johnson, who held his Republican war chest tour, where he protested all over the city. He staged a die-in. Does anyone know what a die-in is? If you were in college during the Iraq War, you probably saw those, where people lie in fake coffins to protest war. They're not very creative. But yeah, it's called a die-in, right? Uh, at some point, one of his colleagues stole an American flag from some business, right? He handed him the flag. He doused it with kerosene. He set it on fire. He said, America, the red, white, and blue... We spit on you. He's a poet, I guess, of some sort, right? Okay. He, the police didn't bother him when he was going on his little rampage, his war chest tour, saying how Reagan wants to start World War III and, you know, they want to kill the people and nuclear whatever. But after he lit the flag on fire and someone found it and actually buried the remains, he was arrested. Of the 100 protesters at that rally... He was the only one arrested because he was the one who had the uh, uh, had the flag and burned it. He was prosecuted under a Texas law, which was in effect in I think 48 states and the federal government at the time, which made it a crime to desecrate a venerated object. Desecrate a venerated object? What does that even mean? Well, the Texas law actually wasn't limited to an American flag. It said venerated object, which would suggest in my mind a Bible. I suspect the Bible included. Any of you guys know the name Terry Jones? He was that, that preacher in Florida 
who decided to burn Korans uh, the last year or two. <laughs> Burning stuff really pisses people off. Um, these are symbols that people have a very strong attachment to, and they represent someone. I was actually talking with this the other day, is why do we pledge to a flag, right? Why do we not pledge to the United States? Why do we direct our attention to an object? Well, it's a symbol, right? It represents everything the country is. I mean, this was in just Rehnquist's descent. We're not talking about a mere piece of cloth with some stars and stripes, Betsy Ross's, you know, snazzy design, right? This is something that's endured and actually grown with us for almost 220-something years now. And you're not just attacking the flag. You're actually attacking perhaps all of us. Well, that's, that's the thinking behind this law. So let's first start with fighting words, right? Why is burning a flag not fighting words. Why does burning a flag not want make people want to punch you in the face? I'm sure the people in this room who have punched a guy in the face, right? Jared? Yeah, thank you. Right. Well, according to Justice Brennan, you're not a reasonable person. I set you up for that. Brennan says, sorry, Brennan says it's not reasonable to want to punch someone for burning a flag. Uh, we, we, we can debate that point. So the court first says this is not, you know, fighting words. Okay, what about maybe obscenity? Well, no. There is some political value to burning a flag. What's the political value? What's the message conveyed? I don't like this country. I hate this country. Okay, so even though we might disagree with the message or perhaps reject it emphatically, this is a message which has value. So by burning a flag, you're not just keeping warm, right? You're not just making you know light that you can see. Oh, say, can you see, right? You are sending a message, a very clear and unequivocal message. So then we have to ask a question. This is speech, right? We agree that burning a flag is speech is conveying information. Is Texas's law based on the content or not? Does Texas's law regulate flag burning based on the content or not? Mm -hmm. okay, so the court looked at two possible answers. One reason why, Texas said, is we want to prevent breaches of the peace. <laughs> We're afraid that if people burn flags, that they'll create commotions. Right? We don't want people causing a disturbance of the peace in public. The court rejects this very quickly, saying, first of all, BS, that was not in the record. No one ever said that. And you have a separate crime to punish breaches of the peace, right? If someone disturbs the peace, you can arrest them under that. You're only arresting people based on the burning of the flag. So that, that's not the right reason. I'm sorry. That's a very good question. I've asked that myself. Was Johnson ever charged with theft? I think you could have been charged with destruction of stolen property. But that would have got him a year in jail, though. Destruction of stolen property, you know, Slap on the wrist. Okay. Texas' second interest was the real one. The second interest was we want to preserve the flag as a symbol of nationhood. Hmm? We want to preserve the flag as a symbol of nationhood. <laughs> We want to ensure that everyone knows that we are one nation, right? One nation, under God. By the way, everyone know the under God part was only added in like the 1950s to the pledge? That wasn't in there initially. It's a fairly novel invention. Combat What's that? It was Everything was about communism back in the day. Gotta, gotta get the red scare, right? So, Brendan said this, this, this law was argued as a, as a way to promote national unity, okay? So what about O'Brien, right? O'Brien test. Well, the first two are very easy, right? Does the state have the power to regulate, you know, burning stuff? Well, yeah. You can't start a barbecue in the middle of a street. You can't have a bonfire, you know, in the middle of a, you know, uh, a park. You have to be... That's fine. But, uh, what's the second factor? Does this pursue some sort of important governmental interest? Yeah, I'd say so. Promoting national unity. That, that's a good thing. We're going to promote patriotism and jingoism and all that jazz. But where it falls apart is a third, Right? Is this law related to the expression of speech? Right? 
is this decision to ban the burning of flags related to suppression of speech? And the answer there is an obvious yeah. The answer is a clear and unequivocal yes. That banning the burning of flags relates to the uh, suppression of speech. That's why the law is there. They want to stop the speech. And on this, on this prong, the court says the answer is yes. Therefore, folks, we are not in O'Brien land. We are outside of O'Brien. The O'Brien test does not apply. Once we hit a no on that third factor, we're out. O'Brien does not apply. Therefore, when O'Brien doesn't apply, what's the appropriate standard? Strict scrutiny. This is a content-based restriction. It's based on the content of the communication. Therefore, it's presumptively unconstitutional under strict scrutiny. When the regulation is not under O'Brien, that means it's content-based. And when it's content-based, you apply strict scrutiny, and the law is presumptively unconstitutional. So I get that. And once you apply strict scrutiny, the law is done. Kaput. There's no way that law is surviving. So basically, you have a speech issue. You first have to figure out is this speech, and then you apply O'Brien, and then if O'Brien fails, then you figure out it's content based, and then you apply strict scrutiny. More or less, yes. So. The path is actually not so clear. I know you're all going to try and flow chart this in your book. Um, that's why I explained it the way I did. If it's content-based, it's strict scrutiny. If it's content-neutral, you apply O'Brien. But the annoying part is O'Brien step three is effectively asking, is it content-based? Right? The third step in O'Brien is effectively asking, is this based on content? Is this related to suppression of speech? So I, do it the way I said. Not, not that way. Right? You ask, is it content-based or is it content-neutral? If it's content-based, you go strict scrutiny. If it's content-neutral, then you can go through intermediate with, with O'Brien. Okay? So the law struck down a 5-4 to four vote. Interesting footnote to that. Justice Scalia voted with the majority. And he's on record saying this was a very important case because he disagrees with the outcome. He says, I hate the outcome of this case. I think flag burning is a horrible act. But... The First Amendment compels me to vote in a way that I don't approve of. Justice Stevens dissented. And he served in the military. He was actually a code breaker during World War II. Right? He should probably try breaking the code in his own book. Maybe that would make a little more sense. Right? So he basically said this is a symbol of our country. He could read with Rehnquist in dissent. This is a symbol of our country. This is not just an average thing you're burning, and you should, you, the guy should be prosecuted for it. Okay. Interestingly enough, Scalia is probably one of those pro-free speech justices in the court, which you might not think. He's effectively in the majority of every single good free speech case ever, which is, you might not think, but he's very good in the First Amendment, very pro-First Amendment. All right, questions? Yes, sir? Sir, the O'Brien test is, is not the immediate scrutiny test you're talking about. O'Brien is intermediate scrutiny. It is the test. Yes. That's why I said it's not like the protection. It's this four-factor thing. Okay. So, questions? Yes. I don't know. You can ask him. He's on the he's on the book tour. <coughs> don't read the book though. It's really I'll I'll lend it to you if you want. It's not very good. It's really it's really not. I could I couldn't read the entire thing. I tried. I tried. Other questions. Uh, Judge Posner has this great quote. He says, "A Supreme Court justice writing a book is like a dog walking in its hind legs." The wonder is not that it's done well, but that's done at all. Posner said, a Supreme Court justice writing a book is a lot like a dog walking its hind legs, right? It, it's not that it's done well, but it's done at all. I, I, I agree with Posner on that one. Okay. So what happened afterwards? Well, Brennan, because he's Brennan, mentioned a few points. There's a federal law also, right? The federal law also. What do you think happened the next year? They challenged a federal law. 
And the very next year, by the same 5 to vote, it struck down the federal law. So now, President Bush, 41, proposed a constitutional amendment to try to ban flag burning. It didn't go anywhere. And it's actually arguable whether such an amendment would even be constitutional, but I'll, I'll leave that aside. So any questions on flag burning? Okay. Uh, Okay, so after the case, they list a number of these smaller cases which discuss time, place, manner. So one case, Kovacs versus Cooper, K-O-V-A-C-S, talks about sound trucks, where a city can ban you know, these trucks with these huge speakers. You ever see these, like, these huge speakers on the roof? The city can ban those because they're too noisy. Uh, another case, Heffern versus the, the Krishna consciousness. These are the Hare Krishna people uh, who try to solicit donations. And the city said, if you go to the state fair and you want to solicit donations, you have to pay for a booth. You can't wander around the state fairgrounds. Uh, another case, uh, Ward versus Rock against racism. This is a case involving Central Park, uh, where, where New York City required this concert to buy or to rent their own sound equipment, and uh, that was held as a, as a valid manner regulation. Uh, one of my favorites is, uh, uh, what was it? Um, uh, uh, Clark versus uh, Coalition for Creative Nonviolence. This is one of my favorite ones. This group, which was trying to raise awareness for homeless people, decided they wanted to camp out in Lafayette Park across here from the White House in a shanty town. They called it a Reaganville, right? They wanted to build a shanty town across the street from the White House to try and uh, to discuss the plight of homeless people. And the Parks Department said, I'm sorry, we don't issue camping permits for Washington, D.C. <laughs> And they sued, and the Supreme Court said, "No, you can't. Uh, that's a valid ban of regulation. You know, I'm sure they might want to protest there, but the permits are never granted to camp in Washington D.C. Therefore, they lose. The Parks Department won there. Okay. Oh yeah, it was Clark versus Community for Creative Nonviolence. That was it. All right. Any questions on time, place, and manner? All right. I know there's a lot today. Digest as much as you can. These are these are things which you actually may actually encounter at some point in your career because it touches a wide wide range of things. Um, so we come to before the internet, there were actually things called adult movie theaters, right? They existed, and the purpose of them was to watch movies involving pornography, right? There was no video stores, there was no internet, so th that's how it worked. So we have this case called Renton versus Playtime Theaters. What a lovely name, Playtime Theaters. Uh, I actually was near Renton, Washington. I wanted to go visit, but I didn't get a chance. I, was, I want to see if the place is still there, but I, I, for, for, for research purposes, right? <laughs> so, no, a, actually, I, I would not have gotten in. I was taking a, a picture of the outside. Actually, I do have a picture of the, no, I have a picture of another strip club in New Jersey from a different case, but not this one. Uh, Shad v. Uh, 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 County of Mount Ephraim, I think the case is. So what happened? Renton, Washington passed a law that said, you can't build any sort of adult movie studio within 1,000 feet of a residential zone, house, church, park, school. You see these laws all the time. You can't build this within 1,000 feet of a church, park, school. These laws are BS. The reason why is there are very few places on a map that are not within 1,000 feet of one of these places. So imagine you're a 1,000 foot radius around all these different places. The only existing places to build are actually in industrial zones. Right? The purpose of these laws is to effectively ban or relegate these places to nowhere. So I think I might have mentioned this, but I'm not sure. Did I mention the, the uh, methadone clinic case? Okay, so I did one case when I was clerking involving a methadone clinic. Everyone know what a methadone clinic is, right? This is a place where people who have opiate addictions can get various treatments, try to wean themselves off heroin or whatever. Okay, so uh, there were plans to build a methadone clinic in this small town, Du Bois, Pennsylvania. The second the city found out, they freaked out. Now, initially they tried basically passing along saying you can't build a methadone clinic in the city. And that was litigated and they lost because that's unconstitutional, violates the American Disabilities Act and other things, right? So then they tried another way. They said, okay, fine. You can't build a methadone clinic within 500 feet of a park, school, church, you know, all, the entire ro roster, right? Fine. So they found a place in the industrial zone where there was nothing nearby, right? They were clean. So what did the city do? 
Well, there was a strip of grass on the sidewalk in front of the clinic. They designated that strip of glass a park. Yeah, that's my reaction. They designated this strip of grass a park so they couldn't build. That was actually a violation of equal protection. I, I mean, I wrote the opinion, but it, it was a violation of equal protection. That was, no, no, you cannot do that. Right? They were basically targeting these disabled persons with, the, with their um, zoning law. So here we have something similar. They didn't ban adult movie theaters. They effectively just said you can't build them anywhere. You have to build them out in the, in the sticks, in the industrial area. Uh, uh, so then we have the, the litigation. Now, the court here actually upholds the law. They uphold the law. So the first question we ask is, is adult movie speech? And the answer is, yeah. Pornography, not obscenity, pornography is a form of expressive speech. It's showing skin and action and acting and I don't know what else. But to get me in trouble. Right, but it is speech. Okay, so if it is speech, then we ask our second question. Is this a content-based regulation or a content-neutral regulation? Right, is it content-based or content-neutral? Now, if any of you have any reality check, use Joseph Sotomayor's word, get real, right? Of course this is content-based, right? Did they regulate... Uh, uh, adult bookstores? No. Do they regulate um, bars? No. Do they regulate massage parlors? No. They only regulated adult books, uh, adult movie theaters. Okay. But Justice Rehnquist said, no, this, this is a content-neutral regulation. They're not banning strip, uh, adult movie theaters. They're merely regulating the time, place, and manner in which they can exist. Really not time and manner, place. They're saying you can only build it in certain areas. This is a time, place, and manner regulation. All right? So this, so we are in O'Brien land, right? This is intermediate scrutiny, according to the majority. Does a government have the power to do this? Yeah, a government has the power to zone. You'll learn all about zoning next semester in property, too. So that's the first one. Does government have the power? Yeah, they do. Uh, is there some sort of important governmental interest? Yeah, keeping, keeping strip club, adult movie theaters away from kids is important, I guess. One of my friends grew up in the Heights. He said there was actually a strip club in the Heights, like right near a residential area. Does anyone know where this is? Anyway, so she had to like walk past the strip club to go to the bus stop. Whatever. <clears throat> so, is this unrelated to speech? That's the third O'Brien test. And Rehnquist said, this has nothing to do with the speech. Not looking at the content of the speech, we are only regulating where they can exist. Um, that's a difficult proposition to accept, but that's what the court does. And is there some sort of substantial burden on free speech? No, because they can open up their club, you know, in the industrial zone, not outside of town. Right? Okay. Rehnquist makes a big deal about how local government should be able to experiment, that they should try to uh, decide the best way to promote their collective welfare. They have plenty of other places to build, you know, that, that they can open up these theaters. So were they actually trying to regulate strip clubs? No, they were trying to police the secondary effects. Okay, what, what do I mean by secondary effects? Well, who usually hangs out around adult movie theaters? No, I didn't say it. He did. Right? People up to no good, right? People who go to uh, adult movie theaters usually aren't there to, uh, you know, open a church or something. I don't know. They're usually up to no good. Crime often attracts these places. Right? Strip clubs, adult movie theaters, they often attract crime. Drugs, prostitution, abuse, fights. I'm sure many fights break out at strip clubs. I'm sure it happens. So the, so, the, so the city was trying to actually regulate these secondary effects. They weren't trying to regulate the speech. They were trying to stop fights. Okay. But then Brennan says in dissent, do they do the same thing for bars? Do they say that bars can't be across the street from a church? Lots of fights break out in bars. I, I'd humbly submit there are probably more fights in bars than in adult movie theaters. People are probably watching movies, right? They're, they're, they're otherwise occupied, right? So 
Oh. Right. So they, they regulate bars, no. Oh. They regulate speakeasies, anything else, no. So they were only regulating one type. So Brennan said this is not about secondary effects. This is, this is purely about one thing. Also, Brennan makes an important point. They only brought in this interest of secondary effects after litigation started, right? When they first passed this law, it was clearly meant as a way to keep out these strip clubs. But the second they got sued, they actually amended the record saying, oh, by the way, we have all these other great interests about stopping fighting. I have a serious problem when the government's able to change the facts after litigation starts because you're fighting against a moving target. You're fighting against a moving target. Right? You file a lawsuit based on something, and then a year later they change the facts. That's almost a rational basis type review where they'll accept late facts, make up facts, whatever. I don't, I don't like this, but it happens all the time. Okay. So this law is upheld. So now we have all of the points. In fact, Houston, which was fascinating, the city without zoning, recently passed a law that I think is going to be, un which I think is probably void, to uh, regulate uh, adult establishments in Houston, in the city of Houston. Everyone know about the uh, the zone de erotic by the Galleria? Is it closed? No, no, no. It, it was grandfathered in, I think. I've never been inside by Pat. It, it's what? From the outside, right? I don't judge. We don't judge in this class. There's no judging. But they basically, Houston passed a law. Um, also, if any of you are interested um, in the Ashby Hires, I'll be on NPR next week at noon, next Tuesday at noon. Yeah. You have to listen. I'll find out. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you next week. I'll do the shtick. Yeah, I'll sign now. All right, so they upheld it. So questions on strip clubs and adult zoning and things like that. Yes. In Houston? I I know, and those those laws are probably arguably void. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're void, but the city is just it's, the city ignores zoning laws all the time. They do a lot of things they shouldn't. I can't. I can't sue them all. I mean, you know, I'm only one person. Yes. They can go restaurants that are closed to school. They can use alcohol. I'm I'm almost positive that the city of Houston Council can't do that, but I I can't sue everyone. I, I really can't. Yes. Think of the children. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they were trying to petition a city hall to, uh, I guess, take away their uh, permit, their, license. their liquor license. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they got lucky. <laughs> L lucky at Twin Peaks, huh? Yeah. yeah. All right. Anything else? We move on. All right. Let's talk about incitement, right? So incitement is a very um, specific act. What do you mean by incitement? I rile people up. I get people so excited that they turn into some sort of mob and do something really bad. So I myself am not doing anything you know, illegal, but I'm encouraging people. I'm inciting them. I'm causing them to want to break the law. Okay. In most circles, we call this persuasion, right? <laughs> we persuade people to do something. I mean, that, that's what demagogues do for, for generations. But at various points in American history, that act has been criminalized. Mostly, or most, well, since the Alien Sedition Act, we had in World War I the Espionage Act. And actually, another local, the Sedition Act. They actually named it after that, right? What did the uh, Espionage Act and the Sedition Act do? They made it a crime to oppose the war. Holy crap, right? It was a crime to oppose the war. Woodrow Wilson was no friend. Uh, he was no friend of liberty at all. He effectively arrested people on the spot who would speak out against the war, who would speak out against the draft. Forget fuck the draft. If you even mention the draft and say you shouldn't do it, you'd be arrested. We've come a long way. And there were over 2,000 convictions under the Espionage, Espionage Act in World War I. And think of all the people who didn't speak out because they were afraid of this. I mean, it's hard to convey. During this time, the postmaster censored the mail. You couldn't even mail certain publications that were deemed traitorous. They would arrest people for speaking out for giving speeches. Um, 
Now, to Jarrett, they were mostly communists, right? These were mostly socialists who were opposing the draft because they opposed the United States government, but that, that doesn't matter. They were, they were opposing the war. So there were a number of cases that are mentioned somewhat briefly in the notes. I'll walk through them somewhat rapidly, uh, all by Justice Holmes, of course. Uh, the first one's called Schenck, the United States, S-C-H-E-N-C-K, the United States. And this is the famous clear and present danger test, which maybe we may have heard of, right? This is the shouting fire in the theater. So in this case, you had Mr. Schenck, who tried to um, print pamphlets that said that the draft violated the 13th Amendment. He basically said that the draft was unconstitutional. I say it all the time. Dude was arrested, prosecuted for a crime. Okay, the Supreme Court and Schenck upheld the conviction. And Holmes has this very famous line, which is not very good. Right? The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. That the freedom of speech will not protect a man shouting in a theater, fire, and causing a panic. Okay, why? Because the speech by itself is not what's at issue. It's the consequences of the speech. If someone yells fire in a theater and causes a panic, people start storming the doors or trampling over each other. It's really bad. Has anyone ever been in a place where fire was called you tried to exit quickly? How orderly was it? People like a fire drill, like, do you still fire drills? Do you still do those? Was it like a fire drill? No. I mean, I remember a number of years ago, I mean, this was 10 years ago, there's a Rhode Island nightclub. Really cramped, and there was a fire. And basically, everyone got trapped because they were all trying to flood. No, remember that? Everyone was running for the same door. People just, they burned to death. You don't want to be in a place where there's a fire. All right, so, Holmes says, not all speech is good. A speech can incite violence, right? If I'm giving a speech to oppose the draft, I'm giving a speech of massive disobedience. I'm not going to be protected. Okay, so that was the Shen case. Another case decided, I think, a week later was Frowerk. F-R-O-H-W-E-R-K. Rhymes with twerk. So in Frowerk, I know people laugh that they're actually listening, not just typing blindly. I, how many people type twerk into their notes? Oh, none of you? God. I can't stop. So we have, we have Frowerk, right? Um, this is a guy who was convicted for publishing a newspaper. Imagine that. First round protection, freedom of the press. You get arrested for publishing a newspaper. It's remarkable. Holmes upheld it. Good old, good old Ollie, right? Then we have the third case in this trilogy, as it's often called, which was Debs. Eugene Debs was a socialist. He ran for president several times. Uh, Woodrow Wilson locked him up in prison for 10 years for being a socialist. He gave a speech. And in the speech, he opposed the war and opposed the draft. Holmes said, yeah, that's okay. You can do that. You can't stop the recruiting process. No immunity. So Holmes upheld that. Okay. The next term, though, we had another case where Holmes dissented. At some point, he changed his mind on free speech. And the matter in which he changed his mind is actually this big debate, which I don't really agree with any of them. Okay. The case was Abrams versus United States. Abrams. And this is where they upheld the conviction for handing out various pamphlets for a labor strike. Holmes dissented. Holmes basically backed away from his previous opinions. He said, yeah, we're in a time of war and things are dangerous. But we need to be able to share ideas. He has this concept of the marketplace of ideas. The marketplace of ideas. Right? The best test of ideas is to get accepted in competition. If I say the draft is bad and you say the draft is good, let the people decide what the answer is. Right? Let the people figure out the correct choice. Don't let the government do it for them. And that was a very significant change because that was probably one of the first opinions that actually said you have a first amendment right to talk out against the government. Holmes changed his mind. 
I'll give him a little bit of credit there, but not much. Okay. So any questions in that line of cases? It's a, it's a fascinating history, the, the World War I period. Fascinating. <clears throat> All right. Last case. We're almost there, I promise. Last case. Brandenburg v. Ohio. Okay. This case builds on the incitement issue. When does speech that perhaps incites violence become no longer protected? Okay. So the facts of this case are actually kind of funny. You have a Klansman call a reporter and say, hey, we're having a meeting. You want to come by? Bring some cookies or something, right? No. He says, come to our meeting and bring a camera. Okay. So the guy brings a camera to this Klan meeting. Right? What happens at this Klan meeting? In addition to hurling many, many racial epithets against blacks and Jews and others, they say this is an organizing meeting. That we are going to march on Washington, D.C. was with 400,000 strong. Right? We're going to march on D.C. with all these people to protest the Civil Rights Movement. And then we're going to march in Florida and Mississippi. Then he said that blacks should go back to Africa and Jews should go to Israel. But, you know, you get the gist of it, right? We should march on Washington. In the video, there are lots of guns. They were holding crosses. They were holding, you know, they're, they're hoodie things, right? What was the purpose of this video? All right, well, probably a couple. I don't think they were actually going to march in Washington, the 400,000. I don't think that ever happened. But they were trying to intimidate people, right? They were trying to intimidate the people in Cincinnati, the African Americans, saying, hey, we're here. There are a lot of us. We have guns. Watch out. They were trying to scare people. Perhaps they were also trying to um, recruit, right? If, if you know, your, 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 your humble neighborhood white supremacist sees the Klan on TV saying, oh, shoot, I didn't know there was a chapter in this town. Let me go to their meetings. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me check what their next meeting is. Well, it was also a recruiting device. They wanted to recruit. And not just in Ohio, the national news picked it up. So nationwide, because like, oh, wow, those guys are cool. Let me join them. Right? I'm, I'm sure it happened. But was this speech a clear and present danger, right? Was this like shouting fire in a theater? Did it, did it present some sort of immediate, urgent harm to others? And here the court said, no, it didn't. First of all, unlike the speeches by Debs and the newspapers and the shouting fire in the theater, this wasn't live, right? This was recorded. So the time people saw it, they know it already happened, right? This wasn't sort of live incitement, right? It wasn't imminent. There wasn't some sort of immediate urge. So if you watch on TV, you're probably in your living room. You're not going to make it angry at it, but it's not going to incite you to violence. So the court actually held, strikingly enough, that this was protected speech. And, and they have this two-part test, which is actually pretty easy. Right? Does it, one, incite or produce imminent lawless action? Keyword is imminent. Does it incite or produce imminent lawless action? Or two, is it likely to incite such action? So unless it actually incites some sort of immediate imminent violence, then it's not incitement. And that video was protected speech. Yes. No, that's the opinion was per curiam. No one wants to sign it. No one wants to sign it. So the cross burning case was Virginia versus Black. That was like a 2003 case, and the Supreme Court basically said that if the cross burning is a form of a threat, then it can be regulated. If it's not a threat, then it can't. Especially if the cross burning is done on someone's private property and there's no one there to watch it. In the video, yes, it was a cross burning, yeah. But no one was there to even see it. It was only seen on TV later. All right, questions?
<coughs> Jenna? No. Questions? All right, that's all I got. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. See you all on Monday.